So we see about uh, 100 people a day at Heartside Ministry, right in the heart, right in downtown Grand Rapids, folks who are homeless or living with extreme poverty. And our mission is that in the chaos of life on the street, Heartside Ministry nurtures a safe space where our neighbors know they are loved, valued, and find their voice. And then we offer ways to give that voice expression. So through art, which we'll talk about in a bit, our gallery and four different studios, a GED and literacy program. We have had uh, 30 GED graduates this year, which is twice as many as we've ever had. Uh, we became an official GED testing center a year ago. We just keep building that program, and we've been privileged to work with Jane. Where's Jane? <laughs> There she is, Jane, I'm in the Literacy Center of West Michigan on our literacy program and had some good success there as well. So, congratulations on your retirement. <laughs> well, we have a number of support groups. We have a social worker, advocacy department on staff, and uh, a lot of folks also use our space and a lot of other organizations like uh, Cleanworks, Cleanworks, which is a needle exchange program on the Grand Rapids Rep Project. They exchange about 8,000 needles a month at our location. Uh, we're their primary site for that. Um, we also are a church, so our church uh, is gathering right now as well, so I bring you greetings from them. And our next big step is to move in, uh, expand our visual arts into performing arts, so uh, music and drama and, and dance. So we're excited to be moving in that direction. We're supported, I get this out of the way now, we're supported by people like you, so thank you for those of you who uh, are doing that, and an invitation for those who would like to. There are some envelopes on the host table in the back with my big picture on the paper there. I don't know who did that, but uh, thank you. Uh, so if you uh, want to support us, that's great. We're supported by individuals, foundations, churches, businesses. So. And also this artwork up here is for sale. And 80% uh, of the sale price of each piece of art goes back to the artist. The only two pieces that aren't for sale are this one here, the one that, with the SIC on it, and there's a, oh, and then the butterfly. Those are part of a permanent collection. It was our art prize entry two years ago called Unchain the Neighborhood, 15 pieces uh, that was named one of the top five entries in two-dimensional art in our prize. So that was exciting for us, and it's now a traveling exhibit. It just happens to be our place, so I got to bring a couple pieces with. Um, I just want to start by saying that it's about common humanity. It's about what, what we were just talking about up here. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that I have to say to folks and sometimes to myself over and all over again. It could be any of us who are homeless tomorrow, whether it's a car accident, a health crisis, a mental health meltdown, and in fact, there are some of us in this room who have been homeless at times. And a lot of it has to do with whatever support system we happen to have at that time. And I'm also grateful to share with you all those values of uh, being creative, compassionate community. So uh, on to marginalize, marginal eyes, outsider art as truth telling. And in order to get into that, I want to ask you to, to do a little bit of what we did in the class this morning. I want you to walk through your home. And look at the artwork in your home as if you were a guest. So you're walking into your home for the first time. And look at the artwork in your home. And see if there's a piece that stands out to you. And then think about where that piece is. And consider, maybe, what might it mean for that piece to be in the entry? of your home, as guests first came in. How can we work to have art change our lives? To have art change our world? I'm going to introduce us to five different artists here. I'm going to start with a quote from someone else and then, and then uh, some words from our artists. Uh, theologian Matthew Fox says this, creativity is basic to our survival. Creativity and imagination are not frosting on a cake, they are integral to our sustainability. They are survival mechanisms. They are of the essence of who we are, they constitute our deepest empowerment. And then he quotes uh, his favorite uh, mystic Meister Eckhart, what does God do all day long? God lays in a maternity bed giving birth. I love that. 
I want to introduce you to Magic. Uh, he also goes by the names Anthony and Loyal T. Loyal T. But I know him best as Magic, and he's one of the most amazing people I know. He's one of those people that's just a bundle of energy, uh, always moving, very quick-witted, exceedingly deep, multi-talented. Um, Magic made his introduction to me uh, in two ways when I first came to Heartside, for almost four years ago now. Uh, my first day on the job, they were showing me around, and he came up to me and he said, how do you tie your tie? Like, I'd never been asked that really before. And so I said this quizzical look at me on my face, and uh, he said, don't worry, man, I'm not going to steal your tie. <laughs> By which he was also calling out the implicit racism in our social uh, relationships and in our social reality. My second introduction came by way of his absence. He'd been gone for a couple weeks. I hadn't seen him, so I asked the staff where he was. And uh, they said he was in jail. And his crime was skateboarding while black, as we call it. That is, was it illegal to skateboard in downtown Grand Rapids? Yes. But it happened to be almost, almost only people of color, our neighbors of color, who were ever put in jail for it, not the kids from outlying areas who came and brought their boards down. Recently, I ran into Magic, and he'd been working at a food packing facility. Uh, however, that job ultimately provided, uh, ultimately uh, proved to be too confining for him, for this person of great energy and creativity. We seem to have very few places in our world for someone who has nothing but raw creative talent, <clears throat> mental health issues, a need to be free, high intelligence, and high energy. Fortunately, the best place we can often find for such people is prison. <laughs> Hear magic in his own words. I guess I'll just sleep in this stairwell like a rat. See where I come from within the slums of reality. It's crazy the amount of degradation we must endure on a daily basis. This is truth. Even if I were to conform, things would remain the same, only disguised with a mask akin to the one that has been placed upon the face of slavery. They call it work now. Only difference is they give us a lose-lose deal and tell us to make a choice. Part of what that lose-lose deal looks like in Grand Rapids at this very moment is that you can remain homeless with all the danger and scraping by that entails with the amount of degradation we must endure on a daily basis. Or you can work, at least so we are told, right? You're homeless, good job. And at even eight or ten dollars an hour, two things are likely to happen. One, you will be hired as a temp worker and let go of the week before you would have been hired in permanently. Or two, you'll find that you can't actually survive on eight to ten dollars an hour in Grand Rapids and pay for rent, health care, transportation, food, etc. And certainly you can't live up to the promises of what comes across on the myriad of screens that have replaced the sun in our world, some would argue. My daughter picks on me when I say things like that. Like your kids will have the screen on their hand, they won't have to hold the phone. <laughs> Magic writes on that subject, there is an insidious message emanating from the TV screen every time I turn it on. I catch the glimpse of it, and if I close my eyes and focus, I can hear the silent shouting clear as day, nudging and cajoling my subconscious, <coughs> attempting to infiltrate and persuade me. You should feel like, be like, this is what you need to be thinking. Your life should consist of thinly veiled lies, masking a network of confusion, anger, and unhealthy amounts of sorrow and woe. In his short companion poem, it is always so invasive when it comes, silently tiptoeing in the night, footsteps upon its path, light as baby's breath. Magic speaks truth to us from the margins about our media world and its impact. Truth that, that is so often for us simply the air that we breathe. He helps to expose it and to enlighten us. He continues with this poem, this haunting hollowness, it does not fade. Its yawning moth only expands, encroaching upon my territory's door, knocking, knocking, imploring to be let in. I give no reply. 
Though it shall come again, I will dare to answer. Who then doth let this cancer in among the sheep, a wolf to slaughter the lambs? Now, lest you think magic only writes about negativity, he also writes this. To write with sober mind, it's titled, I ponder how it will be to abstain from any and all artificial cures. For that place inside my spirit which cries out to be loved, out for me to seek my true self, out for me to obtain my God nature, out for the affections of my Creator. And this one. Oh, I, this love I have for you has been cultivated in the garden of my spirit, irrigated with water drawn from the well of thoughts in my mind. It is deep-rooted, unwavering, everlasting. I bequeath it unto you. Magic's gift to us today. Our next uh, artist is goes by, by a butterfly, and the butterfly up here is, is her piece. It's only, excuse me. It's the only piece we have in the gallery right now uh, and in the ministry because uh, she's moved on. And uh, she, in fact, she married another artist that she met in the gallery. They got married and they're, they're living elsewhere now. Um, and they did a joint piece, actually, um, with an artist who does Aboriginal art. Uh, they did a joint piece that was an art prize. Uh, last I knew, it, no, it's not. Anyway, but it was amazing. Um, and I'm going to read one of her poems first because it kind of follows some of magic stuff right there. Um, Butterfly has, has had several traumatic experiences. That's one of the things that's common among all the people we work with, severe trauma. Uh, Drug-induced psychosis, extreme anxiety, uh, struggled with bipolar disorder, paranoia, borderline personality disorder, um, public about having made several suicide attempts. She says, I wear long sleeves so I cover my arms so people don't ask about the scars. As well as a lot of good and goodness and beauty and love. She writes this. Time never stops. It just keeps going on. Every breath is another second gone. Don't waste your minutes complaining and dwelling in the darkness. All the time will once chase away the light. People like it when you take your happy pills. Just a suggestion. <laughs> Victoria Tischler is... A, the senior lecturer in psychology at the University of the Arts in London. And she talks about outsider art in this way. The art created by outsiders reveals illuminating truths about what it is to be human. The work is real and pure. It has a depth that contrasts with the often contrived offerings of conventionally trained artists. It shows us what we dare not think, let alone speak. The artists tell seemingly bizarre stories translate hallucinatory experiences, or depict imaginary and fantastical worlds which trace painful personal trajectories. They reveal the psyche, our dreams, our nightmares, the afterlife. The art is an unknowing yet visionary. The artists do not subscribe to standard art school criteria. This is what separates them from the mainstream. From a psychoanalytic perspective, outsider art delves into our vast unconscious, that part which represents us, but which we barely recognize or are aware of. We look in order to understand the other and to understand ourselves. Outsider art adds gravitas to an existence that nowadays can feel very superficial. It is uncensored, it transcends speech. Butterfly writes a lot about angels. She writes this poem. He found a lost angel with broken wings, face down in the mud and so alone. It had no will, no foresight. It saw nothing but darkness. No one heard it screaming. No one cared and no one understood. It was at its end. Then he picked it up, made fun of it, joked with his evil friends about it and laughed at its face and heard it in every way. He then gutted, gutted it, and told it to smile. She writes this poem called Circles and Circles that I think a lot of us can relate to, especially if 
We have sock drawers like the ones that Cindy mentioned. I had this great list of stuff that I've been off the past week. I had this great list of, list of stuff I was going to get done, and most of it's still there. But I did get chickens yesterday. I'm way excited about that. It's been three years since we had them, and we're excited about that. Um, around, around, I go. 20 projects all at once. Can't finish a thing. Must finish something, anything. Paranoid of being seen. Waiting sucks. Waiting. 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 Is there an end to this madness? In circles I go. Circles and circles. And my favorite quote from Butterfly is this, I wonder, when God is sad or confused, if God cries too. Our next artist is uh, Dennis, whose picture we looked at, uh, painting we looked at in the group this morning. And I want to introduce uh, Dennis through another artist named Eric Shapiro, who says, see, the function of art if its existence on this planet can be boiled down to just one function, is to alleviate human loneliness. All of us do this thing alone. Regardless of the love in our hearts, we're inhibited by the limits of our flesh. The artist, like the lover, the best friend, the hot girl who smiles on the subway train, says to you in words or sounds or pictures or all of the above, I'm here with you. I need you, man. I'm not embarrassed to say I need you bad. The planet's getting more confusing. The truth is far stranger than we'll ever know. And the crust of BS caked over that truth seems to thicken with each passing moment. So pierce it. Get in there deep. Show what's underneath. I don't care if it's silly. Try it. Light, goopy, scattered, uncomfortable, disturbing, excessive, unending, vitriolic, paranoid, dark, severe, flippant, buoyant, overwhelming, or obtuse. Because cash aside, the world needs your truth. Ego aside, the world needs your vulnerability. And odds aside, the world needs your light. So the picture we looked at uh, this morning of Dennis's was this one, speaking of the world meeting your light. Uh, Dennis, again, has experienced much severe trauma. Um, he's been shot, stabbed, attacked, beaten in a car accident. Uh, he has head injuries as well as some mental health issues. Um, when his sister was killed in a car accident when Dennis was still in high school, he thought he would never write again. Uh, but when he came into the gallery and sat there for a while, and was invited to be a part of the writer's circle, he started writing. And he hasn't stopped. Uh, he says he's written over 500 poems. I think it's probably more like, more like 1,000 at this point. Uh, one of them is this. The world outside my door, in the Hartford neighborhood, is changing daily. And our future is unsure. Urban renewal has forced some out. The high rises are going up and the prices get as high as anyone could want to spend. And this heart side change is evident. But right outside our doors remain the same elements. Our city street life is ever present because there's homelessness and high rates of unemployment. As faces change, some things will remain the same when the world outside is home. So there's another piece here by Dennis that has a poem on it, and then uh, another piece here, again, with a huge amounts of light and a, a lighthouse. At least that's what I'm interpreting it as. I learned in a group this morning that we have all kinds of different ways of interpreting these. Even some of the things that somebody might, I might look at and say, that's what that is. Somebody else says, no, I think it's that. It's wonderful. Um, and that's one of the things that we see in our, in our artwork as we work with uh, our artists, is that their art does tend to get uh, lighter the more they're with us. I want to read this poem from Dennis called Real World. It's, uh, yeah, okay. It never ends. You know the stories because you're written in the words. And still it becomes too real because fiction has no place here. It's the real world. If you can't hang tough in the city streets, you already seem too much. 
As the city spins the story, haven't you seen enough? It's no place to look for love. You are an uninvited guest. Some out there have no hope left because they have no place to run. You can't hide from the sun, chase a world that's already gone. It's time to find the world within. There's a fire inside that burns into the darkest nights. As you walk away, leaving broken dreams, under street lights and morning comes, there's a home in disguise. As you think these people are friends, the streets rule and there are so many fools. Can you use your tools to get the talents you possess to rise above confusion, to get off your chest and break the illusions? Because fiction has no place here. Welcome to the real world. Next artist is uh, Scott Robinson. Uh, and a, just a brief quote to introduce him. Scott's a graffiti artist. And this quote from Banksy, some of you are familiar with an artist named Banksy, a popular graffiti artist, primarily working in Israel and Palestine. And he says, if graffiti changed anything, it would be illegal. <laughs> graffiti is one of the few tools you have if you have nothing. Graffiti is one of the few tools you have if you have nothing. How do you influence the powers that be? So that's how Scott started. Scott started as a youth, as a graffiti artist. Um, but he got uh, sick of the scene, as it is in his words, sick of the scene and the threat of incarceration. And he ret retreated into his black book, his little black book, where he was doing drawings and sketches. And before finding the gallery and then beginning to work in other ways and, and on other mediums. So his, for instance, is this uh, piece here on the skateboard. It's an old skateboard. It's broken. Um, elephants have a special meaning to some people, I understand. We heard about that this morning. Um, and he has this other small piece here uh, that says, found, not lost, uh, with the, this monkey on it. Um, not lost. He also often writes, uh, again, about social commentary. So there's this piece, again, this is a piece of our Unchained the Neighborhood Art Prize entry, where uh, you can't see it up close, but the, the figure here out of his mouth is spewing dollar signs. Uh, of course, the buildings are in the forms of dollar signs, and the sky is dollar signs, and the sun is dollar signs. And is this the world that we're constructing, or that we're being asked to live in? And how do we, how do we support that world, or how do we work against it? And then our final artist is uh, Wendy Robin, who I want to introduce by uh, we have a quote from George Hartwell, who I understand was here recently, right? Former mayor, also if you don't know, former director of Heartside Ministry for 14 years. He says, art provides a pathway into a realm where truth becomes clarified, where beauty takes new dimension, and where the creator and the observer enter a sacred space and see each other and the world in which they live in a new way. And I find that to be especially true of uh, Robin. So her pieces, this is one of them down here. Um, Again, Robin found herself uh, homeless when black mold was discovered throughout the home she was renting, and she was forced to leave immediately and leave everything behind. And uh, did not have any artistic training and not really done any artwork before that point, but finding herself homeless and with time on her hands and without being able to communicate with her five children, um, except through letters to her son who was in prison. And so she would write letters to him and she would draw the letters. And then she was encouraged to start trying other mediums. And so she started to paint. And um, she started to paint with paintbrushes, but that didn't work out so well. They're messy, they're hard to clean, they're hard to carry. Uh, people, they can, people can keep them in our studio, but she wanted to be able to work elsewhere. So she started working with a spoon. So this painting and her paintings are all, all done with a spoon. Um, I just love the movement and the, the dynamism. Uh, present in it and the way that it connects all the different parts of the world and, and this reconciling. Um, there's this underwater scene here. David, he did such a nice job of displaying these. I don't want to 
mess it up. But there's this underwater scene here, and you're all free to come and look later. And there's a couple small abstract paintings that she's done as well. And, uh, and she will she will say when I when I came to the studio, the stuff I was doing was really dark. And now you can see how bright and full of color. And she says that reflects my life now. She's gotten home again. She's got back in touch with her kids again. Um, I share these stories not because they're nice or not to make us feel good or bad. I share them today so we can ask ourselves individually and collectively, how can we ensure that we make space for the voices and the visions of the marginalized to show us what we can't see about ourselves and our world, and then to work to form that world around shalom, around peace. One of our artists, Gil Horn, says this. We are creations with the ability to create whatever our mind can think of. Because of this, we've seen art heal and turn a group of individuals into a family. Art is the bread of our community. And I invite you to consider where we began. Your homes. Our homes. The art in our homes. And what does that reflect? How does it inspire, encourage, provoke? How is it beautiful? How is it just? How is it truth-telling? How does it express our deepest values? How does it connect us in community? And then how did we move it out into public art as well? I conclude with this poem from Sean Heron called Feeling God. I went out this morning, and the winter melted back, and the water flowed like spirit gushing from a rock. The clouds let through the sunshine to warm a cold heart, and I smelled you in a flower, warm inside a window, and I saw you in ice crystals reflecting light like rainbows, and I heard you in the witness of pure, unsoiled snow, and felt you in the presence of the universal power. So I wore you like a robe that covers all injustice. I drank you like the spirit gushing from a rock. My neighbor, Sean, again, thank you for the privilege of being here with you all for your support.